and they that love God said hallelujah stand on your feet if you're comfortably able why don't we give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning come on let's worship the Savior I serve a risen Savior he's in the come on I know your hands if you believe he lives now we're gonna need some hand claps on this what a mighty God we serve come on sing what a mighty God yeah yeah angels bow before you heaven and earth adore you what a mighty God let's say that again what a mighty what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. Angels bow before you. Heaven and earth adore you. What a mighty God. What a loving God. What a loving God we serve. What a lovely God we serve. Angels bow before you, heaven and earth. What a loving God. Come on, what a holy God we serve. What a holy God we serve. What a holy God we serve. Angels bow before. 
What a holy God. What a mighty God. Say, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. Angels bow before you. Heaven and earth. Angels bow. Angels bow before you. Heaven and earth. The angels bow. Angels heaven and earth the angels angels bow before heaven and earth what a mighty what a mighty God do you believe it yes sir. come on we can do better than that what a mighty God we serve what a mighty God we serve You may be seated. I don't know if you were around last night, but we talked about hallelujah being the highest praise. And so I'm, I'm going to ask y'all to do something a little different. Preacher said that not only was hallelujah the highest praise, but if you couldn't move your body. So I'm going to ask you to do it again. And I'm going to ask that when we give God the praise this morning, that you act like that you are in the stadium, that you are cheering for the Cardinals, <laughs> that you cheering for the Bulls. Listen, you can tell how old I am. I like the Bulls. <laughs> all right, all right. So this time, we're going to give God some praise, but we're going to cheer. We're going to try and take the rafters off, all right? Can we give God some praise this morning? Don't we serve the God this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah for you all the good God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. Well, I am Sonia Williams, the dean of the seminary. <laughs> Thank you, y'all sure know how to make a girl feel good. I but it is a joy to be here, to be able to worship with you. I welcome you to worship. I welcome you to Eden Seminary. I welcome you home, amen? It is also my honor to welcome to the pulpit our preacher for the day and the recipient of this year's Senior Preacher Award. Matthew Miller is an MDiv student in his final semester here at Eden. That's worth chanting. Matthew is seeking ordination in the Presbyterian Church USA. And Matthew was elected this year by Eden's faculty to be this year's senior preacher. Matthew, we, have, we appreciate you. Congratulations. It is also time for our call to worship. If you would join me in the call to worship. Responding when you hear Christ is risen by saying Christ is risen indeed. All right, so we've already been practicing how to be loud and all right, so, all right, just, that was a warm up, all right? So the Bible waving politicians beckoned with promises of wealth and influence and threatened with the lash of the cross, still the long deferred dream of beloved community dawns again, for Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. Though the gospel is twisted with bigotry and lies, Though Jesus' ministry and solidarity with people who were wounded and cast out is weaponized until it is hardly recognizable, still the memory of a resistance movement that could not be extinguished lives on, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Though voting rights are surpassed across the country, though desperate immigrants are vilified, stereotyped, persecuted, Though the moral and spiritual values of diversity, equity, and inclusion are distorted and disparaged to stoke fear, even so, the Holy One who maintains the cause of the needy and executes justice for the poor, as the Psalm says, who shatters every pretension of fascist power, just as lightning shatters the cedars of Lebanon, that the Holy One will always have the last word, the last laugh, 
and the last dance on the shores of the Red Sea. For in spite of it all, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another, saying Christ is risen, and then replying with Christ is risen indeed. Now this is an opportunity for you to stand, for you to hug. Now for some of us, that means we're going to elbow bump, we're going to fist bump, we're going to hug, or honor the God in one another. Amen? All right, so let's try it. If you will rise to your feet so we may pass the peace of Christ, I will say Christ is risen, and you will say Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. You may pass the peace. Join me as we read together the opening prayer. Welcome to those of you who are on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, if you are with us online, you may also read the prayer out loud. Uh, we ask you to remain muted, uh, but there's no reason why you can't, wherever you are, uh, say this out loud with us. Please join me as we read aloud and pray together. Holy and Eternal One, Radiant light of Easter dawn, you who have been here from the beginning, 
We give thanks for the resurrection of your son, Jesus, and all the smaller resurrections that we have seen with our eyes, that we have looked at and touched with our hands. In this holy hour, bless our fellowship together and deepen our fellowship with you. Speak to us again the word of life. Raise us up in spite of all that demeans and destroys, that your beloved community may come near and our joy may be complete. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Righteous One, risen among the people. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm excited. Mm, I'm excited. The reading is from the first letter of John, chapter one, in which the author testifies to the life that is in Jesus and encourages the reader to walk in the light and truth. Amen we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, hallelujah. And we have seen it and testified to it and declare to the eternal life that was with the true parent of all and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you also have a fellowship with us and truly our fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This message we have heard from him and proclaimed to him that God is light and God, there is no shatter at all. If they say that we are fellowshipping with God while we are walking in a shadow, we lied and do not declare what is true. But if we walk in the light, hallelujah, as God is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, he cleanses us from all our sins. If we say that we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess with our, if we confess our sins, the one who is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins. Again, he will cleanse us for all our unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we have made God a liar. And God's word is not in us. My children, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but anyone does sin. There's an advocate, the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he's adorning the sacrifice for our sins. And not for our, own, our sin only, but for the sins of the world. Hear what the Spirit, the Spirit, is saying to the church. With unmuted voice, let us declare, thanks be to God. Let us all say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I uh, thank you, Jesus.
Good morning. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank the professors and the faculty at Eden Theological Seminary for this tremendous honor and opportunity in offering the senior sermon for the 2024 Spring Convocation. I'd also like to thank my fellow Eden friends, graduates, and students. During my time here, those who I've had the great privilege of meeting, knowing, and growing with have taught me so much about what it means to be a lifelong learner who joyfully pursues God with a heart on fire. I thank you for your sustained wisdom, your steadfast patience, and uplifting encouragement over the past two and a half years. I'd also like to take a moment to lift up and thank our speakers and panelists for being here today and this weekend week to provide faithful insight and wisdom on such critical issues within our nation. And now, friends, will you pray with me? Mighty God, let now the words which come from my mouth and the meditation that is upon all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our salvation. Amen. There was one particular subject I always struggled with in school, math. Math and I always seemed to have deep disagreements. I struggled with basic division in the third grade and I never really figured it out past that. I remember spending hours every night nodding my stomach over the kitchen table trying to work out subtraction and division and multiplication problems, my parents occasionally popping in to offer advice that really only seemed to further exacerbate the problem. I, I'm seeing some smiles here. I think this may be something that's happening elsewhere as well. I remember on many occasions asking my mom why I couldn't just use her Casio printing calculator to help me with my math homework, and she was swift to remind me that I wouldn't always have a calculator to carry around with me. You see, I never enjoyed math, and I most definitely did not enjoy math homework. The process of doing math homework was difficult and often tedious. The questions never seemed easy, and I always felt like my time could have been spent doing something more fulfilling. I struggled with math and math homework so much that I remember midway through my fourth grade year, I came up with a clever idea. I had devised a scheme to get out of doing math homework. The plan really was quite simple. At the beginning of the day, the teacher would collect everyone's homework in one large stack. We would pass all our papers down the row and the person at the, aisle, at the end of the aisle had the responsibility of gathering the homework into a single pile, which would then be collected. We would wait weeks, sometimes months, before the teacher would return any graded work and at times it would come back to us upwards of 50 to 60 sheets at a time. Surely she wouldn't notice my missing math homework amid the flurry of other papers being collected, graded, and passed back. So I sent down all my homework, except the math, and you know what? She had no idea. I had done it. I would never have to do math homework again. Hang on just a second. This charade went on for a couple of weeks and the only person who seemed to notice was the nosy girl who sat to my left who regularly gave me the stink eye for having seemingly beaten the system. I remember one day as I returned home, my mother asked me how my math class was going. Oh, just fine. I replied, doing my very best to throw her off the scent. Anything you're needing to do for that class tonight? She asked. Nope, I did it all at school today. 
strike one. The next week, the teacher came over to my desk. Matthew, I was missing your math homework from last week. Do you remember if you passed that down? I think so. I remember passing it down. Oh, well, okay. Strike two. Another week or two passed and I continued my daily scheme of neglecting my math homework, having convinced myself that I no longer needed to worry about it because I was a fluent mathematician. These other kids needed to worry about math homework, but not me. I had a system that worked for me and I knew it. I was much better off focusing on what I wanted to focus on and disregarding the math homework. Then one day, just before our midday break, the teacher began returning the stacks of graded homework. I was ready to go on the defense, to wiggle my way out of any responsibility or questions that may come. Molly, Alex, Chris, Sarah, name after name was called and to each student the teacher handed a hefty packet of papers just as she had always done. The pile started to dwindle down until at the last the teacher held a single manila envelope. I didn't have any of my graded work returned. My anxiety rose. Why am I the only one without my graded work? And then it happened. The teacher placed the manila envelope on my desk and quietly whispered, come see me after class. Strike three. As you can probably guess, my mother and teacher had been in conversation over the past month and had figured out my little plan. They had worked out an arrangement and were both curious to see how long I would continue my charade. I will admit now, in front of all of you, looking back as a 28-year-old, I realize how silly of a plan this actually was. But at the time, I had convinced myself that it had worked. I had deceived myself into thinking that I had done the work. I had lied not only to myself, but also to my parents, my teacher, and I had broken a sense of trust and fellowship with my classmates. I had deceived myself into missing out on a fundamental part of my education and had set myself back by not doing what was necessary and right. Our reading from 1 John today reminds us of how important doing the homework is. The author of 1 John reminds us that when we don't do the homework, we create a mockery of the gospel, and the truth is not in us. When we don't do the homework, we make Christ a liar. We create a scheme rooted in a lie, and the truth is not in us. When we don't do the homework, we deceive ourselves and miss out on the truth, the wisdom that is found in doing the work, breaking fellowship with one another in the process. When we refuse to do our homework, we create nothing more than a travesty and, as Reverend Hendricks might describe it, a brutal sham, a tragic charade, a cynical deceit. And the gospel is not calling us to simply finish a math worksheet. The gospel is calling us to a work of reconciliation, a reconciliation with both God and one another. If we look around our nation and world today, we see the stark results of what happens when we do not do the collective homework. Across this nation, we find 
unholy alliances between so many or many so-called Christians and organizations that support, fund, manufacture, and pro proliferate weapons of mass killing and destruction. We see individuals who claim godliness and then reject and demonize the foreigner and the immigrant. By the way, have you all heard of Leviticus 19.34? You might want to check that out as you head out today. We find sinners welcomed in grace to the table on Sunday morning in churches across America who by Sunday brunch have locked the table behind bars of a cheap, divisive theology that says the one who you love restricts you from experiencing the sacraments and grace of God in Christ. We find Bible-clinching Christians who ignore the first commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me, propping up a bronzer cow, and I do not mean to offend cows in saying that, that promises them control, power, and authority over the woes and grievances of their lives and provides them an outlet for their nationalist ideology. Our nation is saturated with so-called Christians who have for a long time refused to do their homework. And this malaise in doing the homework has produced frightening consequences. Our nation is saturated with Christians who have found comfort in the rote work of division and subtraction, but are much less comfortable with addition and multiplication, especially in areas of grace and right relationship, of sacrifice and communal living. The growing refusal to do the homework that is so necessary has created for us a present moment where so many have deceived themselves, have made Christ into a liar and a sham, and in doing so have broken relationship between themselves, one another, and God. Ignoring the looks and lying through the questions, many have deceived themselves. Many have given up on doing the homework because it is difficult and often tedious. The questions never seem to be easy, and the feeling looms that the work is not necessary, fulfilling, or possible for just one person or it simply doesn't match their narrow political and social agenda. You may be wondering what was in that manila envelope. Well, it was almost two months worth of math homework. All the work that I had skipped out on. My teacher and my mother had arranged that I would complete all the missing work and return it in a timely fashion. For my teacher, a timely fashion was a week. My mom thought that was really cute. She gave me three days to complete it and to include a well-written apology letter to my teacher and fellow classmates. I was restricted to my bedroom while I spent the entirety of the weekend grinding my way through the tedious math homework and writing the letter. It is safe to say, looking back, that that effectively ingrained the lesson of the importance of doing my homework. But I remember how much more I was able to understand in class after that weekend. Doing the work allowed me to recognize that I had indeed deceived myself and I had been perpetuating a lie. I had created a sham that disguised my insecurities and ignorance in a falsehood. And I needed to seek reconciliation with my teacher my parents, my classmates, my God, and myself. Friends, the good news is this. We can find the courage to do the homework because we know new life. We know new love. We know the new reconciliation that is found in the resurrection, new life, second chances day after day after day. The work 
may be and often is difficult, and it may feel tedious at times. The questions may not seem easy, and we may not feel our individual tasks are providing a lasting effect or a fulfilling feeling for us. And we may be ever aware that the work of a resurrection reconciliation takes place in the shadow of the cross, but we are called to be agents in the resurrection reconciliation, in communion with Christ and in communion with one another, to expand, not constrict, the horizons of the gospel and Christ's love. And not just those who we know and are familiar with. Those who qualify specific and rigid requirements, but those who Christ identifies as even the least of these. The immigrant, the exploited, the persecuted, the neglected and the forgotten who feel second class to the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness so boisterously proclaimed. Because friends, if we don't, we can only imagine how far the effects may go. We have a responsibility as progressive Christians to reimagine our faith and challenge the false conceptions of a Jesus who only serves Western, straight, white males. A key aspect of our reconcil reconciling work is to reject preconceptions of the gospel that divide us and claim the promises of Christ for only certain select individuals. To reject false idols and individuals that make a mockery of Christ, his teachings, our faith, and the love of God. To reject the unholy alliances between so-called Christianity and industries of violence, warfare, and oppression. We are called to be a voice for the oppressed, for those overlooked and ostracized. So in engaging this holy and sacred work, we begin to reconcile the story, promote Christ's mission as a servant savior first and foremost, and to renew and reclaim the faith. When we do the homework, we gain wisdom and knowledge, and we recover the ability to live rightly with one another in community, living beyond the illusion of Christianity propped up by hateful religious zealots worldwide. We as individuals are called to engage the work of reconciliation, to push back against the presumptuousness of Christian nationalism and other idolatrous ideologies as an act of both resistance and reclaiming of the Christian faith, and in reconciling ourselves to one another, and in reclaiming our faith, we can come to know true reconciliation with God and ourselves, walking in the light of truth as God, as our partner and guide. Friends, I encourage you today to keep doing your homework. Keep seeking to live out the resurrection reconciliation. Keep asking, how can I restore right relationship today? And most importantly, in these days, push back, resist, and reclaim. Strive to know Christ as Christ is, not as he is so often portrayed. Friends, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. May it be so for us this day and all days. Amen and amen. amen.
And thank you, Matthew. Matt. Thank you for uh, understanding the assignment. Uh, and thank you for uh, helping us to do an inventory, perhaps, of the homework that we have left undone. As we respond to the good news of the gospel by praying for the world, there is a, a part for you to sing, actually, in the prayer, as part of our prayer. We're going to sing it a bunch of times, so you'll get it. Uh, if not at the beginning, then you'll get it at the end. Your part goes like this. For the sake of the world, the world that you love, oh God, we pray. Pray for the sake of the world, and we pray with confidence because of your Son and all you have done. Just jump in boldly. Give it a try. You can do it. I have confidence. For the sake of the world, the world that you love, oh God, we pray. Pray for the sake of the world, and we pray with confidence because of your Son and all you have done. Now just sing that each time it comes along. Please join me in prayer. For all those who were wounded and left without homes after the earthquake in Taiwan, that they may find healing, comfort, and the shelter of each other. For all those who are being terrorized, wounded, and starved in Gaza, and for those in Israel who are traumatized but seeking a path to peace, that they all may be led in the ways of peace with justice. For the people of Haiti, as that country continues to descend into chaos, that their long and brutal history of colonial disruption and exploitation may give way to a future of prosperity and self-determination. And for the country of Uganda, resolute this week in its use of the death penalty against its own LGBTQIA citizens, 
that it may shrug off its legacy of homophobic missionary theology and embrace its queer children. Hear us, Divine One, as we pray. For the sake of the world, the world that you love, O oh God, we pray. The sake of the world and we pray with confidence because of your son and all you have done for the people of this nation so awash in guns and glitter so besieged by bigotry and frightened by fascist falsehoods that the truth of the purpose of our existence in service of the common good may set us free. For those on both sides of our southern border, for missing and murdered indigenous women, for all of our trafficked teenagers and terrified trans kids, that their cries may reach your ears and ours and stir us all to action. Hear us, gracious one, as we pray. For the sake of the because of your son and all you have done. For your church, that it may rise up for love of you and speak loudly and joyfully of your love for the widow and the orphan and the immigrant in the land drowning out the din of white Christian nationalism. For congregations so preoccupied with staying open that their hearts and imaginations are increasingly closed, that they may be liberated to join your work in the world for faith leaders of tolerance and goodwill in every religion, that they, that we, may be granted courage and clarity and a fire shut up in our bones that will not let us remain silent. Hear us, blazing spirit, as we pray. The sake of the world, the world that you love, oh God, we pray. Pray for the sake of the world, and we pray with confidence because of your Son and all you and let all the people say, Amen. Friends, after our closing song and our benediction, we will take just a very short break. We need to reset some things here, and you might need to move around a little bit. Just so you know, there is a bathroom for female identifying people in this direction down the hallway. There is an all-gender bathroom that way down the hallway. Um, please join me in singing, Lead Us From Death to Life.
And now hear your, the charge and the blessing for the day. Friends, go into the world in peace. Have courage. Return no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help those who are suffering. Honor all people. I'm going to say that one again. We know it. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, find the courage and the commitment and the strength to do the homework. Push back, resist, and reclaim our sacred faith. And go into the world in peace, knowing Jesus Christ. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May she make her face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may God always grant you peace. Amen.